Threat by Gottfried Benn, translated by Michael Hoffman. Know this. I live beast days. I am a water hour. At night, my eyelids droop like forest and sky. My love knows few words. I like it in your blood. Look, I don't want to waste your time. This poem makes no sense. And that's my thesis statement. That's even my conclusion. It makes no sense. More accurately, my conclusion is that it's not supposed to make sense. But I just can't get this poem out of my head. There's something intoxicating about the language, and it's not even in the original language. So let's take a moment of silence for the translator Michael Hoffman, who might be the only person who's thought about this poem more than I have. Oh, and Dorothy Ostmeyer, she actually wrote a paper about this poem, but I don't have access to her article. So those two have probably thought about it the most, but I don't know. I actually, um, I, I don't know anything about this author. Gottfried Benn was a German poet, essayist, and physician. So you want to be a poet? Yeah, ja, und essay. Okay, so long as you can manage the doctor thing on the side. He was nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature five times. Five to Oh, sorry, just a nomination. It's not like he won. We're good. So he was a military doctor during the Great War, and his gruesome exploration of the body is what inspired his first publications. So it should also be noted that when this poem was written and published in 1913, he was uh, quite politically progressive, uh, but his history is a little bit complicated because he eventually became a bit more of a national socialist. There's an article written by Jan, Jan I don't know German, Jan Berger. Let's read the abstract. Drohung, Threat, is one of the most famous love poems of Gottfried Benn. The German poet published it originally in 1913 in the influential left-wing journal Die Aktion. After World War I, the young avant-garde writer became more and more conservative, and by 1933 he sympathized with Hitler. This essay reconstructs the forgotten context of Benn's early publications and his close friendship with Elsie Lasker Schuler, as well as other Jewish intellectuals and key figures in the expressionist movement to analyze the consequences and personal problems of his engagement with National Socialism. So it seems like a really interesting read and I found it online, but um, I, <laughs> I can't read German. So if any of you wonderful people out there want to translate 10 pages of German for me, I will love you forever. Okay, thanks. Uh, but yeah, I can't talk about the subject because I don't, I haven't, I literally have not done my research. So it's not going to add anything to this essay. So let's just move on. Also, Dorothy Ostmeyer's essay is titled Beastly Love, Gottfried Ben slash Elsa Lasker Schuler. So... I'm pretty sure their close friendship was a little bit more than that, but um, I, I, I don't know because I can't get behind paywalls. Actually, on the first page preview of her article, it pretty much directly says that it's a direct love poem. But um, again, I can't get behind paywalls, so I don't know. I'm just gonna have to take some shots in the dark and hope that I figure it out. Um, but Dorothy Ostmeyer, I kind of looked you up and you're really cool you teach really cool classes and we should be friends i i would love to be friends with you anyway he was a military doctor and it kind of seems like he always had this connection with this primal ooze and gelatinous goop of the body his words are like shriveled blood cells still traveling through the body but useless these words seem to travel through me pumping in my veins and bouncing around in my head but again my conclusion is that this poem literally makes no sense. But somehow, Ben grabbed his sharpest scalpel and cut me open and inserted each word into me. And now, this poem's a part of me, and I don't know why. So I will grab the scalpel and tear at the surgical tape and find how these words have morphed with my cells and just find out why. Even though, again, it's completely useless. Michael Hoffman, that's the translator, he literally said that getting Ben is sort of an impossibility. Frail structures carrying heaviness of heart, misanthropic, even solipsistic, but full of fellow feeling, ethereal, a shadow on the wall, but always with some minimal roughage. 
They concede little in the way of paraphrasable content, but at the same time, in Seamus Haney's valuable words, they do not waver slash into language, do not waver in it. The poems are as they are, are as they want to be. The opposite of art, Ben always argued, is not nature, but pleasingness. Oh my God, there's so much to unpack. Okay, here we go. So Ben's language does not waver in or into language, which is weird because it's made of language. But then if the goal of language is to communicate, then what we're sort of hearing is that Ben doesn't communicate directly or effectively, which is totally true. Let's read it again. Threat by Gottfried Ben, translated by Michael Hoffman. Know this, I live beast days. I am a water hour. At night, my eyelids droop like forest and sky. My love knows few words. I like it in your blood. My first read through leads me to think of something very primal. There's imagery of nature and the body. There's a beast and blood, water, forest, sky. And there are only two emotions in it all love and fear. Fear, of course, coming from the word threat. I have no sense of whether the narrator intends to project fear or is in fact feeling it. All I know on my first read is that it's primal and there's something captivating about it. I like it in your blood. I'm stuck on that line. And then beast days, is he being hunted? Is, is he the beast? Is the threat being hunted or is love in the blood that the beast is hunting? So then is this a relationship, a hunt for a relationship? Is this hunting in a relationship, some disgusting, vile, unforgivable act? Is this a threat of some beastly love? It would explain the word threat, but the rest of the poem doesn't feel like intimidating language. But also, Yenberger refers to this as a love poem. And that's not love. Also, that analysis really only focuses on the two words, and there's a lot of other words, and every single word in it is incredibly important. Like Hoffman said, this poem and all of his poems concede little in the way of paraphrasable content, which is to say that each word has equal value. There's no wiggle room. Each word was specifically chosen by Ben. Kind of, because technically it's translated? I'd imagine that translating anything is extremely difficult, but something this abstract and strange is this word for word? Can it even be word for word? There's a German word for a punchable face. It's my brother's favorite word. Uh, and it's like Backpfeifengesicht. 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 German-born, raised in England, poet, the world's most influential translator into English, over 80 books translated. Okay, pretty standard stuff. Okay, but how do you go about translating things? Is it word for word? One of his guiding principles for translating, he says, is to avoid the obvious word, even if it is the literal equivalent of the original. When the opening page of a Roth novel contained the word barak, he insisted on going with tenement rather than the barracks, in the second paragraph of Hoffman's version of Metamorphosis, Gregor Samsa doesn't ask, what happened to me, but what's the matter with me? He liked the phrase, he says, because it sounded like someone having trouble getting up after a heavy night. Okay, but translating German has to be super difficult because of all those compound words that just simply can't exist in English. Uh, what's his relationship with German? Hoffman has described German as an open wound, which is soothed and brought to healing by the application of English. But I have come to be very fond of German again. There are reaches of simplicity that English cannot do without sounding ignorant and stupid. In English, you always have to sound as if you are making an effort. English is basically a trap. Class trap, dialect trap, feeling trap. It's almost a language for spies, for people to find out what people are really thinking. Operating in German, which doesn't have these heffalum traps, would be lovely, he says. English complicates things by attempting to trap meaning. And even though Hoffman literally said that there is no getting Ben, I'm still trying to understand this poem in potentially wrong language. 
So basically, I'm doing the English thing. So what's Hoffman's relationship with the English? Well, in the introduction he wrote to Berlin Alexanderplatz by Alfred Doblin, Hoffman says, It's got a quicker rhythm, more economy, less creativity in the idiom, because honestly, it isn't there in English, which is certainly by now more normed, predictable, usage-driven language than federated and regional German, and certainly less flamboyant and idiosyncratic than Berlinish. As David Bellos has argued, translation will most likely tend to plane away the highs and lows of the diction anyway. So, underplay, gesture at something, rather than going any whole hog. And also, the genius of English, with so much more in the way of vocabulary, so much less in the way of grammar, is to me always warmer, more individual, cajoling, cluttered, relaxing, and ambiguous. So basically, English is weird because German has cool words that English sprechers can't keep up with. So let's look at the translation a little bit closer and consider how little changes can offer potentially big differences in meaning. And one thing that should be stated is that Michael Hoffman's translation isn't directly accurate. He takes a whole lot of liberties with it. So I've pulled up all three of the versions, the original German, the Michael Hoffman translation, and the straight from Rugel Translate. Uh, is that how German is pronounced? All right, so a few things stand out to me the most, and there are really only a few changes that I'm going to go into. So the first one is actually the decision to use the German word aber, which more literally means but. Uh, but no versus no this is pretty different. The word but is an interjection, a counterpoint. It indicates a conversation, a back and forth. So how does this poem change if it's in conversation? And does Hoffman's modified translation take it out of conversation, or does it truly emphasize the power of the threat? His translation isn't interjecting, it's commanding. Then there's animal days versus beast days. I know it stands out a lot. Once again, I think it adds to the primal feel and perhaps amplifies the notion of the threat. Also, I kind of just think that Hoffman understands intent in English better than Google does. The most meaningful deviation is the difference of the last line. It is so beautiful about your blood versus I like it in your blood. There's the switch from it's so beautiful to I like it. I can't figure that one out yet. Maybe later. Other translations I've read say it's so beautiful beside or by your blood. Take your pick. Point being, the direct translation offers a preposition on the precipice of the heart, just outside of the blood. Hoffman tears down the barrier with his beastly teeth and shoves the narrator's love into the listener's blood. The poem is inside you. Not about beside, by, around, nearby. It's what's in the blood. Honestly, I think Hoffman is attempting to express an intimacy that the direct translation doesn't capture in English. It might be captured in German by the use of speech itself. I don't know anything about German linguistic culture either, so maybe it's implied. I don't know. What I do know is that Hoffman never picks the obvious word. He recognizes that English is a trap, forcing you to say what you're really thinking. And so Hoffman, in his translation, insists that Ben is being much more intimate than his words let on. Hoffman also says he underplays instead of going whole hog. So maybe this is intimacy, and, and maybe this intimacy is just what's intense in our culture. And in Ben's words, this primal sentiment wasn't what was intense. It was just the love that was intense. He couldn't say what he liked, just what he found to be beautiful. I'm guessing, of course, Beep. Dorothy be my friend. Beep. But I'm doing the best that I can, and it's totally useless anyway. <clears throat> anyway. As Michael Hoffman says, English is much less patient than German. If you've made it this far in the video, I thank you for your patience. Let's start really analyzing this thing. Threat by Gottfried Benn, translated by Michael Hoffman. Know this, I live beast days. I am a water hour. At night, my eyelids droop like forest and sky. My love knows few words. I like it in your blood. How do you, how do you even make sense of all of this? Where do you begin? I didn't research this poem much. I wanted to go out of my way to understand it because I feel like it understands me. And heck, I'm a writer too. I want to find this part of myself that I think that this poem knows, and I want to be able to write that. I want to learn from it. I've said it a million times before. I'll say it a million times again. Every text has at least two authors, the writer and the reader. And this text has three minimum, Gottfried Ben, Michael Hoffman, and me. 
So I'm gonna go through this poem and tell you what I think. The lines know this and my love knows few words both share similar and rare syntax. The colon is an opening, a beginning. The two lines effectively say the same thing. They say, get ready for these next words. So if they're paralleled, are the following clauses also parallel? Let's examine them for now as if they are parallel. I live beast days. I am a water hour. I like it in your blood. So whether you use animal or beast days, depending on translation, I think the tone indicates just absolute grueling days. I nearly imagine someone laying awake at night just saying, Ugh, today was a beast. That might not need much more explanation, but I think that the decision to call it a beast day over an animal day truly indicates the general slog and exhaustion. And then I am a water hour. This is both redundant and entirely opposite of the prior sentence in my opinion, as if his time were passing like water through a sieve. I get the imagery of a boss man calling break time by turning over an hourglass filled with water. By the time the narrator sits down, they have to get back up. It's endless. There's no reprieve from the constant struggle of the day. It's a fight simply to survive. It is suffering. So then how is this parallel to the line, I like it in your blood? There is no reprieve from the constant struggle of his love. He's not just fighting to survive, he's fighting to love. His love is suffering. Let's center in on the center line of the poem. At night, my eyelids droop like forest and sky. This is the turning point of the poem. There's no mirror for it. It stands on its own in the center of everything, longer than the other lines, sticking out like a sore thumb. At night, my eyelids droop like forest and sky. Which must mean that they literally don't droop. I mean, forest and sky are not low. Like, he didn't say his eyelids droop like the sun, which goes down over the treetops and sleeps like a little baby at night. No, he said sky. His eyelids, like forest and sky, do not droop. The treetops reach into the expanding midnight. There's something to be said for discussing the body as a part of nature. It's idyllic and romantic. It again builds on that primal interpretation. So his days are relentless, his nights are restless, and his love is endless. Then the touchstone, the thing that should bring this all together, is the title, Threat. But who is threatened? Is it the narrator? Will this love literally topple him? Is it just too much on top of everything? Is the listener being threatened because the narrator is like a force of nature? That this love that they feel is just so impossibly powerful, so primal, that they are literally warning the listener? I mean, I've thought about this poem for over a month. I've written about it. I've talked to friends about it. I've written this whole thing. But I still had more questions than answers. And I actually started my research by looking at a poet I also don't typically understand, E.E. E. Cummings. Here's what he had to say in A Poet's Advice to Students. A poet's advice to students. A poet is somebody who feels and who expresses his feeling through words. Exactly. Even though this poem doesn't make perfect sense, it very much has feeling. Hoffman says Ben writes full of fellow feeling, heaviness of heart, there's emotions. And though these words may seem practically nonsensical, the feeling is still there. And poetry is feeling, not knowing or believing or thinking. Yes, so it's less about these specific words than the feeling they give you those deep primal feelings that we don't understand because they don't have words. Like an impressionistic painting of the soul, we're bombarded with phrases and terms that fit some vague sentiment, something that cannot be paraphrased, but something powerful still. All in all, this is extremely unfair of me. Michael Hoffman in his introduction to Berlin Alexander Plotz says, it is one thing to be lost in an original, something else to be lost in a translation. A translation is unwilling, perhaps, to allow or stand up to the amount of interrogation from the reader that an original must expect. It has everything to fear. It is, after all, an imitation, a performance, a substitution. Every word of it is wrong. It seems to be a difficult thing, in some ways even a dereliction of duty, for a translation to be baffling, or to transmit in a passive way, bafflement. So Hoffman totally failed because I am completely baffled, but he did warn me about that up front and 
he did also make it make more sense by translating in a super intentional way. And I guess what I'm getting at here is that uh, this poem doesn't make sense, but it doesn't need to because it makes me feel something. It makes me feel something here in the moment now. And that's enough. I feel, I read, I write, I am. Hi, my name is Andrew Seco, and I put on my best shirt to tell you that I'm a storyteller. Actually, I'm more like a story glutton. I listen to audiobooks on triple speed. I read multiple poems and articles in newsletters daily. I listen to music nonstop while working on any project. And I ask everyone in my life about a million questions a day. I just love a good story. And I can't get enough of them. But the one thing that I love more than devouring stories and creating my own is collaborating. And I want to collaborate with you. I want your input on what I create. Because I want to do everything. I want to write songs and make board games and video games and website versions of the board games that I'm creating. And it's a lot. So I could use your help and I could use your guiding, pointing fingers to tell me what direction to go in. And the way that you can do that is by supporting me and supporting what you like. So on my Patreon right now, I've got three different tiers. First up will get you my endless appreciation and early access to all my content. The second tier will get you all the music for my videos, not just the snippets and such, but fully mastered tracks. It'll also get you exclusive content like the original scripts. And last but not least, the third tier will get you a big ol' thank you in the doobly-doo down below and a custom birthday poem. Like, actually, about whatever you want. A poem I write for you. And if monthly subscriptions aren't your thing, I have a coffee link down below as well. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I'd love to know what you think of the poem and I'd love to read your favorite poems. So share those down below. I don't know, maybe I'll end up talking about your favorite poem in the next video. Or maybe I'll talk about the fact that I actually spelled out each poet's name along with their title card in the song that I wrote for them. Who knows? Beep. Dorothy, Michael, we should all be friends. Beep.